Hey guys, Tom here from the Investing with Tom YouTube channel. Welcome back to the channel. Uh, just before we get into today's video, I want to say a big thank you to everyone who has subscribed to the channel so far. We've just recently ticked over a thousand subscribers, so massive thank you for that. Um, not going to do it in today's video, but in the next video that you'll see come out on the channel, I'm just going to do a small giveaway to say thank you for, for everyone that has subscribed to the channel so far. It's not going to be anything massive, but uh, keep an eye out for that. So um, today, in in terms of what we're going to talk about in this video we're going to go through the most recent 13 f filings that just came out last week um, over in the us so the 13 f filings are basically filings that come out in the states every single quarter and it tells us what American-based investors have been buying and selling uh, within America. So it's not going to include any of their international holdings or, or anything like that. It doesn't include options and that kind of stuff. But um, things that they've straight up bought shares in or sold shares in, we can uh, see in these 13F filings. And it's a great way for us to follow our favorite investors and see what they've been buying, see what they've been selling, and try to generate some really good ideas uh, to go forward with our own investment research. So I'm going to go through my sort of favorite investors to follow in the 13Fs. If there's anyone you think I should be looking at that I haven't, feel free to drop them in the comments down below. Uh, and I'm going to give you a bit of commentary and my sort of opinion on uh, each of the 13Fs and some of the changes that we're kind of seeing uh, through these great investors filing so without further ado uh, let's get into it hope you enjoyed the video if you do hit like hit subscribe uh, but for now let's get into it all right so we're going to get into this one uh, we're going to jump straight into some of the big boys and get into uh, some of the really big famous investors with uh, the likes of Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett I think that's going to be a good place to start and then towards the end of the video we'll get into my personal favorite investors outside of those two with the likes of Guy Spear, Monish Pabrai, uh, those types of investors so hang around for that one at the end um, and just before actually we even get into Charlie and Warren, I just want to go through one quick sort of special mention. So um, this one's quite a quick 13F to look through because literally nothing has happened in the last quarter. And that is the 13F of Himalaya Capital Management. And I'll put the screenshots up of, of all of these different 13Fs. So Himalaya Capital Management is the investment fund managed by Li Lu. So Li Lu is a Chinese born um, immigrant to America who actually now manages some money for Charlie Munger. He's basically the only fund manager that Charlie Munger has ever really put money with. And he's made about 30% returns um, over his investment lifetime. So phenomenal returns. Uh, the reason we're not seeing any, any buyers or sells or anything with Li Lu is he's now really focused on Chinese investments. So just looking at his holdings history, he hasn't actually had anything invested in the states since the third quarter of 2018 so um, it's one that i always check unfortunately there's nothing in there for now uh, but that's the first one Li Lu out of the way okay so the second 13f uh, again it's going to be a quite quick one because because there's been no activity um, but at least you guys can add this to your list of 13fs to check as well so this is actually the daily journal corporation and if you haven't heard of the daily journal corporation it's essentially a company that um, the investments for which that company has are managed by Charlie Munger directly. So um, obviously every year Berkshire Hathaway has their big annual meetings with uh, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger and they have this big Q&A session. And although uh, Charlie Munger is obviously involved in that, um, the Daily Journal Corporation annual meeting is actually Charlie's kind of big event where it's all about uh, Charlie and you can ask him questions directly as well. So that is very cool, uh, but in terms of the investments, we haven't seen a lot of activity for a few quarters, even a few years now. So if I actually scroll right down to the bottom of this, I'm going to see that the uh, time that he's held his top 10 and his top 20 positions, and he hasn't even got 10 or 20, so the time that he's held all the stocks in this portfolio uh, is 23 quarters. So he hasn't made a single transaction through the Daily Journal Corporation uh, in 23 quarters. He's, he's held those for over five years. If you ever listen to Charlie Munger, you'll know he's a very long-term investor. Uh, he buys very high-quality companies, so he's not trying to um, buy something to make a quick profit. He's holding it over the long term. Uh, so not 
hugely surprised to continue to see that with Charlie Munger, uh, but again, it's one to keep an eye on. So uh, his biggest holdings currently, over 50% of the Daily Journal Corporation portfolio is in Wells Fargo. Um, lots of other financials in here as well. So about 40 odd percent is worth uh, Bank of America, and that makes up uh, just those two alone, north of 90% of the portfolio. Uh, he also has US Bancorp and a steel company called POSCO, uh, also in the portfolio, but more minor positions. And again, no change to those over the last quarter. So uh, that is Charlie Munger with the Daily Journal Corp. So uh, let's get into Warren Buffett. Okay, so let's get into Warren Buffett's company, Berkshire Hathaway, uh, their 13F. So um, just a word of warning before you go diving into Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway 13F and just trying to replicate everything and doing all that sort of thing. There's a couple of things you should probably just know with this particular 13F. So um, at this point, the portfolio is quite large, uh, both in dollar terms and the actual number of companies in there is quite large as well. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Obviously, Warren Buffett is enormously wealthy, so there's going to be a lot of money in there. Um, but the second thing is he's been building this portfolio up over a long, long period of time. And you're going to see positions in there like American Express and like Coca-Cola, um, companies that uh, he's held for a very, very long time. So he's had uh, some of those companies for over 40 years now. Very long-term investments. Uh, he may have purchased shares in the 70s and 80s and never added another share since. So if you're going to um, you know, want to replicate this portfolio and you start buying Coca-Cola, for example, it's unlikely to do as well as um, as Warren did with it back in the day. You know, he had about a 10 or 12 kind of multiple 10 or 12x on uh, that Coca-Cola investment. Uh, these days, it's growing at about the rate of inflation, maybe a little bit faster through some acquisitions and things and just throwing off a lot of dividend money and that sort of thing. But th that's one thing to note. The other thing to note is a lot of these positions will be uh, quite a lot smaller than the larger positions and that's because Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway actually have a couple of other money managers in there. So um, the big one is Warren Buffett. He's managing the vast, vast majority of this money. Um, but he also has uh, Todd Combs and Ted Wexler, who I'll put up uh, photos of on the screen. He also has those two guys in the office uh, managing money as well. And either Todd or Ted were actually the first ones to start buying companies like Apple. Um, they actually bought Amazon more recently as well. And that is actually not Warren Buffett. So it's quite hard to distinguish uh, what's Warren Buffett and what's not in these 13 Fs. You can make an informed sort of uh, opinion on that just based on purely the size of the investments. Um, if it's you know $20 billion going into one stock, Ted and Todd's, you know, portfolios are only about 10 or 12 billion each. So that's obviously Warren Buffett going into those positions. But um, Ted and Todd have a larger sort of investment universe since they're managing less money. Uh, so that's some things to, to kind of watch out for there. But in terms of what happened, uh, so again, it was a pretty quiet quarter for Berkshire Hathaway as well. So they made some purchases in Occidental Petroleum and RH. So RH is not a company I'm familiar with at all, really. So if you know anything about that, uh, drop it down below. I'm uh, just judging on the size of the position. I'm going to guess that uh, that was most likely Ted or Todd, just looking at the pure percentage of the portfolio, which uh, is less than 0.1% of the portfolio. Uh, and the other one is Occidental Petroleum. So Warren Buffett actually made a deal with Occidental Petroleum to uh, help them with an acquisition uh, earlier this year, or it might have even been mid, mid last year. Um, so they acquired a company called Anadarko. And as part of that deal, Warren Buffett was to be given some preferred stock in Occidental Petroleum. So that's what's happening there. Um, but really outside of that, there weren't any huge changes. There weren't any, you know, huge new positions put in. Apple is still the big, big chunk of the portfolio. It's about 25% of the holdings now. Um, no change, obviously, in Coca-Cola or anything like that. Um, there was a slight trimming of Wells Fargo. If I just have a quick look at that. So there was a slight trimming of Wells Fargo. That's something that you'll tend to see pretty much every quarter with Berkshire Hathaway. So Berkshire owns just a 
fraction under 10% of Wells Fargo, uh, and they want to keep it that way. So if they go over 10%, they um, become a bank holding company, and there's a whole lot of regulations and things that come with that. Um, and Wells Fargo is constantly buying back shares. So as they buy back shares, uh, Berkshire Hathaway's interest in that business goes up, and it can creep above 10%. So they're basically just selling off little chunks, little chunks, little chunks to kind of keep them under that 10% threshold. Uh, so that's that one. The other thing that jumped out to a lot of people in this particular 13F was uh, there was a reduction of about 750,000 shares of Apple. And um, you'll know that Apple is a company that Buffett has started buying in his portion of Berkshire Hathaway uh, of that of that money. Um, over the last two or three years and if you know anything about Warren Buffett's strategy you'd be surprised if he was actually selling any shares so um, basically it's, uh, it's my guess at least and I think this may even have been confirmed that uh, Ted and Todd are probably selling those shares uh, again a couple of reasons for that so uh, Ted and Todd manage a fixed portion of money so if they want to go out and buy something new they have to sell one of their stocks to buy another stock that's just the way it works when you've got a fixed kind of dollar amount uh, portfolio. Whereas Warren Buffett, um, he has a whole bunch of money already in cash and he gets the money of the underlying operating businesses of Berkshire Hathaway constantly sending cash to him as well. So um, if he wants to buy something new, he's got a bunch of cash stacked up sitting there ready to go. Uh, so he doesn't have to sell off stocks or do anything like that. So um, my guess, and I'd be willing to put money on that to be honest, that, that that's probably Ted or Todd that um, is highly unlikely to be Buffett in my personal opinion at least but who knows he might come out and say I'm wrong there so um, that's the Berkshire Hathaway portfolio and, and some changes there in the recent 13F nothing huge um, but always an interesting one to keep an eye on so let's get on to the next one all right, so two more 13Fs to have a look through, and the final two are Guy Spear and Monus Probri. So these guys are very, very good friends, and you'll often see actually a lot of overlap between their portfolios. Uh, and it's interesting, really interesting, with one particular company, um, Monus Probri has actually made a reasonable size move uh, out of, and it's a company that he's held for a long period of time, and Guy Spear actually continues to hold. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next uh, few quarters with that one as well, but let's get into that. So I'm going to start off with Guy Spear. So his company is called Aquamarine Capital Management. So if you ever want to look up the 13F or any uh, shareholder letters or anything like that for, for Guy Spear, that's the uh, term to search. It's Aquamarine Capital Management. Uh, and a couple of small buys. So the first one is Micron Technologies. Uh, this is a position that Monish Pabrai actually put on um, in the fourth quarter of 2018. So he's held that for, for almost a year now. Uh, and Guy hadn't bought, to my understanding at least, hadn't bought a single share of Micron uh, up until this quarter. So it's interesting to see that Guy Spear is starting to follow Monish into that position as well. Um, it's still quite a small percentage of the portfolio. If I just quickly look at that, uh, it's only about 2% or so of the portfolio, which um, by Guy Spear's standard is, is quite a small percentage. He does run a relatively concentrated portfolio, not as concentrated as Monus with you know three or five or six stocks, um, but still much more concentrated than your average um, hedge fund or anything like that. So just starting to creep into Micron. Uh, with the 13Fs, we do get like a 40-day delay on actually getting this information. So there's a chance Guy has been continuing to purchase or there's a chance he was like, changed his mind, got out of it. You know, th these numbers may have changed in the last uh, month or so. Um, but that's a very interesting one to see. Um, other things we've got going on with Guy, so he also slightly increased his position in Seritage Growth Properties. So Seritage Growth Properties is a company that Guy has held for a reasonable length of time now. Uh, I don't know a huge amount of, about the company personally to be honest, but I do know that they are tied up with um, Sears, uh, the retail store. Um, so interesting to see Guy continuing to add to that. There were zero sales, so he didn't sell anything. And if we just have a quick look at the summary of his top holdings, um, really not much has changed. So he's still got um, Ferrari and Fiat Chrysler as two of his larger positions. Um, if you've been a follower of these guys for a little while, you'll know that um, Fiat Chrysler actually used to own Ferrari and they spun it off. So uh, you'll see that 
Guy owns about 2 million shares. Nice round number. I need to start doing that in my portfolio. Uh, nice round number of uh, 2 million shares in Fiat Chrysler. And he has a nice round number of 200,000 shares of uh, Ferrari. So basically in that spin-off that Fiat Chrysler did, uh, they were given... Uh, all the shareholders were given about one share of Ferrari for every 10 shares of Fiat Chrysler that they held. So um, Guy continues to hold that and it's been uh, a pair of investments that have performed very, very well. Uh, second biggest position is Berkshire B and if you combine that with Berkshire A, which he also owns a little bit later down the list, it's definitely one of his larger positions. So not too much to say on that. Um, it's something that you'll see quite commonly in some of these guys' portfolios is they'll be investing alongside Warren and if they don't have any better ideas, they sort of say, Warren, you can you can have it. I'll invest in Berkshire with you. So um, that's that one. Um, and really outside of that, there's not many uh, huge changes. I'm just having a bit of a look through here. So still owns American Express. Uh, no real changes in share number there at all. Um, guys, a, a person who's a little bit less active, not that Monish or any of these other investors are short term investors or anything like that, um, but a little bit less active. And if you do see a new position sneak in, it tends to rise to the top or, or at least close to that um, relatively quickly over the next couple of quarters and it'll be held there for a long period of time. So um, that's Guy. Um, again, if you've got any opinions on some of those changes, drop them down below. Um, but for now, let's get into the final 13F, which is Monish Pabrai. All right, so last 13F I just want to go through is Monish Pabrai. Um, this one jumped out at me as some of the larger changes that I've seen and one of the bigger surprises in keeping up to date with this round of 13Fs. Uh, if you don't know Monish Pabrai, I've got his book back here, The Dundo Investor. I've got it sitting next to uh, Guy Spears, The Education of a Value Investor. Definitely recommend reading those books if you haven't. Um, but anyway, let's get into um, Monish. So just one thing to note when you're looking at Monish Pabrai's 13F is he does have a lot of international holdings. So he has investments in places like uh, India, in places like South Korea, I believe Japan and Turkey as well. So there's quite a few countries in there. Um, and the only country that you'll see investments for in the 13F is in investments in the US. So even a company like Fiat Chrysler is not really based in the US. They sell a lot of Jeeps and Dodge Rams and things like that in the US. Um, but that's dual listed on the, uh, I believe the Italian stock exchange off the top of my head as well. Um, that's one thing to note. So although you look at this 13F and it tells you that Fiat Chrysler is 43% of the portfolio, in reality, it's not, there's, there's money elsewhere. So um, that's just one thing to, to look out for. Um, but in terms of the changes, there's uh, been some pretty big ones. So Monish Pabrai has actually sold off quite a big stake in his Fiat Chrysler position. So by the looks of this, it's down about 31% in terms of uh, the number of shares that he owns in Fiat Chrysler, which is very interesting because I don't disclose a lot of the stocks I own on this channel, but I am actually a shareholder in, in Fiat Chrysler. Uh, so it's very interesting to see Monish sell that down because it was a company that I basically cloned from a 13F from Monish. So um, it's interesting to see that Monish is selling it down. Guy is holding it. Uh, Guy Spear has also held Ferrari, which um, Monish also got given shares in in that spin-off, but sold them off relatively quickly. Uh, so interesting to see what happens there. Um, I will be continuing to hold personally um, for various reasons that I don't want to get into today. Um, but that'll be an interesting one to keep an eye on. So uh, my guess on that, especially since Monish has only sold uh, a portion of it. Typically in the past where I've seen Prabhai kind of sell out of these stocks, he sells it pretty much all in one hit, uh, especially if it shoots to the moon in terms of the price, which Fiat Chrysler hasn't done uh, over the last year or so. It's been um, probably down slightly actually in the last year, I think. Um, so it's interesting to see that he's just selling off a portion of it. My guess is that he's taking that money and putting it into other investments. My guess is that he's in this similar situation to sort of Ted and Todd at Berkshire where he needs cash to put it into something else. This is pure speculation, but that's what I'm guessing is happening. Um, but again, interesting one to keep an eye on. So that's Fair Chrysler. Um, in terms of Micron Technologies, so he increased his stake there slightly 
slightly. So he added about another 8,000 shares of Micron. Uh, not too much to say on that one. I've made a video in the past a few months ago about why I'm not investing in Micron, uh, even though I saw it on the Pabri 13F and I would love to keep just cloning uh, Modish, uh, but I'm not following, it, following him into that one. It's just a mile outside of my circle of competence and I couldn't even tell you um, what they do to be, to be honest I could I could uh, tell you that they make memory chips and that's that's about the extent of it so I really don't have an edge in that um, in that area with Micron so it's not something I hold um, but it may be in there for you it may be one to investigate with Monish buying it and the last one is Graftech. So this is a company that Monish uh, started buying last quarter pretty aggressively. Um, my guess just based on the market value, so market value is about 71 million US dollars. My guess is that is about probably a 15% of the portfolio position just from what I have heard of around how big his total portfolio is. Um, so that's pretty big position for Monish. And that uh, again is, is an investment that I've actually cloned over the last couple of, um, over the last three or four months as well. So um, that's one that I'm in there with, uh, with Monish. I'm investing alongside him. So fingers crossed that goes well. Um, it's one that I think I was able to get into my circle of competence and a business I understand pretty well and can really get my head around the investment case. And it's one of these sort of no-brainer investments. And in my mind, don't take that as advice, but um, definitely an interesting company to dive into. So um, GraphTech he's built. I wouldn't be surprised if some of that Fiat Chrysler sale money was being funneled into GraphTech. Uh, but very interesting nonetheless, uh, and some of the bigger changes that we've seen uh, of any of these 13F portfolios. So uh, that's my quarterly update on the 13Fs. Uh, if you don't follow these already yourself, put them in your calendar. They're a phenomenal resource. It's like I said in a, a couple of videos ago, it's kind of like the cheat code to investing for the individual investors just to you know see what these really talented investors are doing uh, and take ideas and, and copy where we can. So I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, hit like, hit subscribe. Um, that's all from me today and I will see you in the next one. Cheers.